So I thought about talking about the genomics of hypertension and precision medicine, and it will be mostly humans and a couple of my, sorry for this, but like Nilesh, I used to really love rats, but then something happened, and we can discuss this in, in discussion. So let's start from Platt and Pickering. The young audience here wouldn't remember, and some of my colleagues who've been studying hypertension for a number of years would know that many, many years ago, before all of us, I think, were born, probably, yeah, I think before all of us were born, there was a big debate in British hypertension. And Pickering, he was in Oxford, so maybe it's not allowed to talk about him in Hingston, but <laughs> nevertheless, nevertheless, Platt and Pickering debated whether the high blood pressure, as illustrated here, is really quantitative or qualitative event. And Platt, clever that he was, did talk about genes at this early times, and he thought that there was one gene that caused some people to have very high blood pressure. And Pickering uh, shouted, uh, he, was, he was pretty sort of British, and uh, shouted very loud at these debates and said that this is completely idiotic and this is a, polygenic, you know, many things contribute, distributed normally trait. And for many years we thought that Pickering was right, of course, and Nilesh's and my um, teachers of hypertension were all Pickering's descendants, so in some way we are, we are grandchildren of Pickering. So we thought he was, but but really both were right, and that shows beautifully the complexity of everything we're studying today. So high blood pressure, the human essential or primary hypertension, the one we don't know what's causing it, so it's very complicated, is illustrated here. But of course we know that there is this small population of monogenic syndromes, and John already talked about it in first talk today, where everything is genetic. When one uh, very beautifully outlined mutation explains everything, what happens with very severe hypertension, quick, uh, frequently early in life in children or adolescents, with all complications, the whole gamut of what we see much later on in human essential hypertension. But this is, of course, rare, and uh, you'll see in a minute that Red Clifton has sort of monopoly on all these syndromes <coughs> and, and um, explain them all. But nevertheless, when I go to the clinic, and Nilesh goes to the clinic, although he goes to a slightly different <laughs> clinic than I, the majority of patients suffer from this sort of garden variety common primary or essential hypertension where there are many things and many genes and many environmental factors and everything is terribly complicated. So we thought that this is important to understand whilst monogenic syndromes are wonderful and neat. And this is Lifton, I am sure you remember and you've seen it before. This is slightly modified from his cell review in 2001. So in red, high blood pressure monogenic syndromes. In blue, the low blood pressure monogenic syndromes. He resolved most of them. And rather beautifully, some are like a mirror image of each other. It's the same transporter, the same gene. And as you see, everything happens in the kidney and everything has to do with sodium and water retention in the kidney. So in some way, there is this common pathway. But of course, that's simplification because, as I said, in human essential hypertension in this polygenic format, uh, it's, it's more, more, even much more complicated than this. And John's 11 beta HSD D2 is here, of course, and that's why I was asking the question, because it's one of those that are fully understood, but nothing is that simple, John, <coughs> yeah? So how have we been doing it? This is the bit that Nilesh already covered, so we can go very quickly. But let me indulge in history, recent history, just a little bit. So when Nilesh and I started looking at human complex polygenic traits, the fashion was the candidate gene. 
And the classic one in our area was the ACE, remember, ID genotyping. And everybody was doing it because it was relatively easy to do. And we used 100 patients and 100 controls. Everybody got opposite results. And there were big debates. And I remember European Society of Hypertension some years ago, and there was big debate, does ACE, ID genotyping, contributes to hypertension? And they were debating. And I was asked to chair, and it was unusual because I was too young and too unknown, and yet they asked me to chair, they didn't have anybody else. And at the end, I said really badly, you know, I hope you won't go home and do more ACE ID genotyping. And that was taken as a terrible faux pas and not a thing to say at, at international debate. But the truth was that it really didn't help us much, was completely non-reproducible, and didn't show much at all. And then Nilesh mentioned the BRIGHT study. The BRIGHT study was a classic genome-wide linkage study. And this was a little better, but we had very few markers. So when we had 300 markers, that was a lot. And we thought we would cover the entire genome. And we got these nice pictures. These were lot scores. And remember that under each peak, like in rat <laughs> genetics, there were hundreds of genes and we had really no way to dissolve it into some meaningful functionality. So GWAS that Nilesh so beautifully introduced before was really a revolution. The genomics of hypertension and other complex traits has become a real science, i.e. reproducible science. But of course, a lot of work. This is, by the way, Nilesh's early um, Manhattan plot. So just to illustrate how wonderful and beautiful they are. So uh, this has been a really, really hard work, but worth it, as you've seen in Nilesh's presentation. This is my cartoon that tries to describe what has to be done to do it properly. And this sometimes takes a lot of work and uh, hundreds of people on the papers. And the criticism was that more people than Jean discovered. I think it's not really right or <coughs> decent to say this. So first of all, we now know that we need to study thousands of cases and controls, and we need a lot of markers. And the most recent GWASs have 2.5 million SNPs, and that's completely different coverage than when we started with the linkage analysis I showed you before. You get your top hits, you validate, you replicate, uh, you obviously get this nice picture, but you can then take it into functional studies, and I'll show one example of this, and you can do risk prediction. And I was worried that Nilesh didn't like the risk prediction. I like risk prediction. I think it brings us quickly close to the patient and the clinic, and I think it's been useful. Certainly in hypertension, GOSs, it's been quite useful. So that's a quick cartoon. Now, Rather than showing you all the studies as we've gone there, I'll just show you one because it encompasses everything because it's been so big that you can't do any better. That's it. That's the best and will never be a bigger or better study uh, of GWAS in hypertension. So this is International Consortium for Blood Pressure GWAS, which looked at systolic, diastolic, and blood pressure, yes or no. Uh, 70 1,000 individuals in 29 cohorts in the first, first pass analysis, and then further 130,000 Europeans. And you see effort to cover the world, because the other criticism that more authors than genes, the other criticism was that everything is done in European populations. So in this study, effort has been made to include other ethnicities. And you've seen, obviously, you're familiar, I'm sure, with this publication in Nature 2011. Ehert was the first author, but one needs to really recognize Mark Caulfield and his group who've done enormous amount of work putting it all together. And this is the main uh, Manhattan plot. You're very used to looking at those for systolic blood <coughs> pressure shown here in red. But what I like to draw your attention to is the commentary for, from the um, editor, so the staff editor in Nature, who said, findings presented in Nature this week could contribute to 
contribute to diagnostic and therapeutic studies. And you'll be judged whether he was right. I am an optimist, so I think he was, but there are still people who doubt. So here you see a combined figure from this paper. So this is what you've already seen. That's systolic blood pressure in red. Very similar picture for diastolic blood pressure in blue. But the important and interesting stuff is on this side when we see all the 29 highly significant genome-wide significant SNPs and their contribution, individual SNP contribution to systolic and diastolic pressure. And I'll show you this if even <coughs> slightly bigger and more clear on this slide. And lo and behold, this individual contributions are not great. So that was another criticism. You spend all this millions, guys, and you showed that you can show approximately one millimeter mercury contribution to systolic and 0.5 millimeter mercury contribution to diastolic. Doesn't ma does it matter? Well, it does because if you select your parents wrongly, and many of us select our parents wrongly, you might in inherit the bad way on all the SNPs, and then if you add all this together, you're into 25, 29 millimeter mercury difference in your systolic blood pressure, and that's clinically very significant. So it shouldn't be taken as irrelevant. One millimeter in one SNP might matter enormously for your overall, overall blood pressure. So genetic risk scores. So Nilesh talked a little about it. I think it has proven extremely interesting for hypertension for a number of reasons. Possibly because, of course, hypertension is this classic risk factor, risk factor for other end organ damage. And epidemiology taught us certain rules, for example, blood pressure and stroke are much more associated than blood pressure and coronary artery disease, and genetic risk score didn't really tell us the same message. So here is the message. In the same paper, so that's the same paper, which had very good uh, group of statisticians who developed this concept of um, the weighted genetic risk score. So it is adjusted for everything. It isn't just an association. It's much more than that. Uh, the score was ov obviously positively associated with left ventricular wall thickness. We expect this. LVH is very closely related to blood pressure. Occurrence of stroke, we also would expect this. We know this from clinic and epidemiology. But rather surprisingly, the genetic risk score for coronary artery disease was stronger. This p-value is much lower for CAD than stroke. And that starts being interesting. Also interesting, I told you that so much is happening in the kidney. All these monogenic syndromes happen in the kidney. Water and sodium retention is so hugely important for development of hypertension, and yet, the risk score was not associated with chronic kidney disease in any way you wanted to measure it. So being it estimated GFR or any other measures of kidney function that we have, albuminuria, anything you, you would use, there was no association. And there is perhaps an interesting explanation in this, and I hope somebody will ask me in discussion about this. I think it's exciting. Now, there's been more work published a couple years after this original Nature paper where genetic risk scores were really looked at in very interesting way and in fantastic populations because you need a good human population to really show these things well. And the first are Finnish cohorts. As you know, our Finnish colleagues have fantastic longitudinal, very well phenotyped cohorts of patients and normal subjects. And this is one of them with more than 32,000 individuals. And they looked at incident cardiovascular events. So that's all cardiovascular events, both CAD and other cardiovascular events. And you see this 
separately for systolic and diastolic pressure, and you see this wonderful almost dose-response relationship here. Um, the genetic risk scores were associated with systolic and diastolic and baseline hypertension, yes or no, at p-value 10 to minus 62. That's not bad for biology. I haven't seen lots of biology with 10 to minus 62. That must be significant, I think. So another paper, and this is cardiogram that Nilesh already referred to. So very large multi-center analysis of patients large group of patients with coronary artery disease. I should add that these two papers, the Finnish and this, um, were published back to back in hypertension in early 2013. Um, so here you see all the 29 hypertension SNPs that came out of the Nature paper. You see their individual effect in the cardiogram for systolic blood pressure, there is identical or very similar figure for diastolic pressure. Here you see described the cohort, so very large number of coronary artery disease cases and even larger number of controls. Very strong association of this so-called blood pressure SNPs with coronary artery disease, so confirms what we've seen both in original Nature paper and in Finnish study and very significant relative risk. And the individuals who, as I said, chose their parents badly are at much greater risk than those who chose their parents better. Okay, and here is the figure from this. And you see very similar pattern again. There is, at least for diastolic pressure, again, this almost pharmacological dose-response relationship, something we normally don't see in epidemiological studies. So I like the genetic risk scores. I think they tell us new things. Now, the other thing we have done, slightly different than this very large GWAS, was to study extremes. And that goes a little back to Platt and Pickering. We sort of a little plattish here. So, we thought that if we select patients from top distribution, so very severely hypertensive, but compare them not with whole population, but with people at the bottom of distribution, so super normal, hyper controls, we call them, you could do a GWAS with much lesser numbers, and you can do GWAS in one lab rather than with all this 150 authors, etc. And indeed, we tried this, working in collaboration again with Northern colleagues, this time with Sweden group in Malmo, who had fantastic longitudinal records. And that allowed us to select these hypercontrols from now 20-year follow-up observation. It was 10 at the time we selected. Okay, so we now have severe hypertension, very normal normal or low normal, and we do a GWAS. This allowed us to have the most extreme GWAS in hypertension ever. I don't think anybody will do more extreme because we've uh, sort of taken away the most extreme patients. <coughs> and it did show things that are just falling slightly below this very, very uh, stringent five multiplied by 10 to minus eight that Nila showed before. But nevertheless, we felt it was worse to take it further. You see it in gray here, this is chromosome 16. And here is the region now saturated with many, many more SNPs than in initial investigation. And you see that they all, all the leading SNPs sit in the gene and more about this gene in a minute. But before we could go any further, um, we asked all colleagues around the world who had similar, not as extreme, but similar patient populations to share their data. So this is in silico uh, meta-analysis to confirm this is the very extreme and this were selected to be similar, but no, not so extreme. And now, when you put everything together, we've easily exceeded the genome-wide significance necessary to, to call it a hit. Now, 
what is this gene and protein in ENCODES? So the gene is called uromodulin and ENCODES a very old fashioned protein called TAM Horsfall protein, which is the most abundant protein excreted in human urine, for which for a number of years <coughs> nobody could find any good function. Although it was called uromodulin, must have something to do with renal function, but it was sort of a protein, a gene and protein in search of function. We know that it's a GPI anchored glycoprotein. I'll show you, it has a very, very interesting location. Um, and as I said, it's most abundant tubular protein in urine, and it is expressed not only in the kidney, but only in one part of the kidney in a thick ascending limb of a loop of Henle known as tau. So very, very selective where it dwells, where it's expressed. And here it's illustrated. So this is the tau cell. There are some important transporters uh, that we heard of before today. And that's where this protein is. It sheds into the urine where it's um, in a polymer format. And that's where it is. So we've been able to look at population, other populations of patients we've had and were able to study. Um, and we found very direct relationship between the urine excre excretion of the protein and sodium excretion. You'll see in a minute. And this was present both in hypertensive patients taken from the BRIGHT study, both Nilesh and I described before. So these were people from the UK, all with severe hypertension. And in general population, this is a study from uh, Swiss uh, elderly general population. And the rare, the minor G allele was associated with lower risk of hypertension and lower excretion of this protein. Uh, and this was very clearly demonstrated. And here you see how uromodulin and urine sodium go together. This is the GG homozygote. <coughs> and we now move to the rat and Martin and Dell are here and can tell you how they did it. And they did some very nice work on the knockout mouse. So the knockout mouse already existed. Um, it was brought to Glasgow and you see here the telemetry, but also tail calf data with and without salt loading. So first of all, blood pressure is lower. It's very significantly lower in the knockout mouse. But most importantly, this is plus plus, this is minus minus. You see completely lost response to salt. And we know that in humans, mice, rats, in normal situation, the response to 2% salt in drinking water is normally very very robust and we were able to remove, or Dell was able to remove it completely. So something really profound is happening <coughs> in this kidney. We not yet fully understand <coughs> the entire pathway uh, and that's why it's such a complicated diagram, but very definitely everything happens in the tal. Very likely there is interaction between this very large and cumbersome uh, gene and protein, protein that uromodulin is, with the transporters that are nearby, that would be the neater explanation. There is some effect on tubular glomerular feedback, and there is a shift of the pressure naturases to the left in here. So we think that, as described previously, with some of the coronary artery disease genes, we have here a new pathway, a pathway that was not known before, that perhaps we can modify and perhaps it will lead to new druggable targets. And the fact that what we found was protective leads to some interesting concepts and interesting possibilities, but more work is required to sort it all out. In the meantime, uh, Sanders Padmanaban in Glasgow is about to commence clinical study 
where he wants to disturb the pathway here at NKCC2. Uh, it will not be frisimide, it will be a similar loop diuretic and it will stratify patients at better and less good responders at this transporter that could tell us more about the pathway that we, uh, we are looking at. And the study is about to start funding, funded by the MRC. So where are we now and what next? We've covered all this. We agree, I think, and I hope you agree that GWAS um, pathway, that GWAS mechanisms, that GWAS strategy has been really revolutionary and got us closer to being able to look at risk, but also to look at more um, animal models and more functional studies, and there is still more to be done. But what will we do next? As we heard earlier on today, there is still a lot of work to be done on gene-gene, gene-environment -gene interactions. Uh, I think you're absolutely right, Bina, it's, it's, it still has to be done. But clinically, I think the stratified medicine or precision or personalized medicine appeals to me enormously because the time has come to take it to the clinic. So I would like to spend my last few slides on describing to you how we're doing it, although sadly it will not be hypertension, but rather cancer medicine that will benefit first, but there is nothing I can do about it. So what is the stratified or precision medicine? Because it's fashionable, it's almost everything, of course. It could look at rare disease risk, common disease risk, but I think it's really here. It's at drug efficacy and dosing and preventing side effects before you start the drug. That's where I think it should be for me in 2014. Now, in order to do this, we in Scotland have funded a public-private partnership <laughs> which we call Stratified Medicine Scotland Innovation Centre. It is led and it is in Glasgow, but it speaks for the whole of Scotland, for four universities with medical schools, for NHS Scotland, all four academic health boards and industry that put their money where their mouth is and mostly our two major partners, Thermo Fisher Scientific and Aridia. Thermo Fisher, you know, this is a major international company uh, with base in California, but it has 5,000 jobs in United Kingdom, a lot of them in Scotland. And Aridia is a Scottish small medium enterprise which put millions on the table in order to facilitate this. So they believed that what we're doing will make some business eventually. So the vision is to transform management of chronic disease, not just cardiovascular disease. And as I said, cancer will be the first beneficiary without any doubts, we know it now. And we look at it not just as research, but as a healthcare new way of providing healthcare on the NHS in the UK and in any other health system outside UK, but also new jobs, new economic growth. This is about industry, maybe more than academia. Uh, you know why? I don't need to explain to this very, very sophisticated audience that we can't afford our healthcare anymore. And it doesn't matter whether you pay for it or not, whether you have insurance or, or everything is free at the point of delivery as it is in this country, we still can't afford it. I can't even imagine what 47 trillion is and how many zeros that is, but I know I can't afford it and neither can our children and grandchildren. So we need to do something differently. So when Nilesh and I and other clinicians in the room go to our clinics, we practice trial and error medicine. And despite all the fabulous advance of research, we still practice the same trial and error medicine that we practiced 20 years ago. So when I go to the clinic, uh, and I do hypertension clinic in Glasgow, or we call it cardiovascular risk factor to be a little more modern, 
Um, only quarter of the drugs they, that I prescribe are efficacious. That's not good enough. My diabetology colleagues, 50%, still not good enough. And the same goes rather drastically for oncology. And that's even more uh, dramatic when you think about the time you have to help the patient <laughs> in various cancers. Now, the opportunity we believe we have, which is better in the UK than elsewhere in the world, but even better in Scotland than in the rest, the rest of UK, and this is not a political argument. Um, politics we can do later. Um, so what we have is we have readiness to implement electronic health records, and we have very good electronic health records, which are longitudinal, have outcomes, can be linked across the country and across diseases and modes of delivery of the healthcare. And it isn't just me who is saying this, I am biased, you might think, but there are other people who are critical and good who say the same. And this is part of the letter that Patrick Valence, who, as you know, is the um, president of the R&D for GSK, said in supporting of our investment. So we can do it better than the rest of the world, we believe. I can, I can take any discussion later. Um, and therefore, we want to move to what we call smart clinical trials, and we're ready for it. In fact, we've started already. So the smart clinical trials are outlined here, and this is in the context of cancer, but I hope the same will be applicable to other chronic diseases, and we're doing it in rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory disorders already, but not in hypertension. <coughs> So the old way is that you have one biomarker, Nilesh mentioned, it could be CRP. If this biomarker is abnormal, the patient can be incorporated into a clinical trial. Of course, this marker could be a mutation, this marker could be a signature of SNPs, whatever you want in the genome. But the patients who do not have this marker will be rejected and treatment <coughs> might be delayed. And particularly in cancer, this is a big ethical issue because patients know that if you are in a clinical trial of a new drug, you do better. And that's been shown very beautifully in a number of diseases, and this is a fact. So in a new way of doing things, you've done next generation sequencing, you can stratify patients and through collaboration across the world, you will always find a trial that your patient could be enrolled in. There isn't a patient left without a trial if we try hard enough. So that's good. And the long-term vision is illustrated here. And you might believe it or not, but it's already happening in a clinic near us. So if you assume, and it is, this is a somatic genome of a, sorry, this is a somatic gen genome of the tumor and it happens to be pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer, many of you would know, six months survival is very good survival. Yeah, many, many patients have less than that. This is peripheral blood. Here you see actionable mutations that in this particular cancer seem to fit into existing cocktails of drugs that are already available. We don't need to develop new drugs. We just need the cocktail of drugs that would give response to this particular type, subtype of tumor. You would have all your imaging. You would have histology, of course, all bloods, urines, real-time data and you are a doctor sitting in front of these windows a week after the patient presented for the first time. And that's the aim of my colleagues who work on pancreatic cancer in Glasgow, and that's what they're trying to do and hopefully will achieve very, very soon. One week, maximally two weeks, to have the right answer, to have the right cocktail of drugs, because every week of delay might be deadly. So. Altogether, as this is a summary of thinking and we heard about metabolomics and I'm sure later in tomorrow there will be transcriptomics and proteomics, 
clearly it is not all just the genome. I think as we progressed with these stratified or precision medicine approaches, we're going to use all the rest of integrative genomics as illustrated here. But perhaps the most important clinically is to get, get our phenotype right. Because we have learned that molecular medicine progresses very fast, we can sequence very well, we can do metabolomics extremely well, but it's the phenotype phenotypic characterization of our patients that is lagging behind. And if we can do that well, we will be able to use this stratified or precision medicine in the clinic near you every time. So my call to you, because you have the biggest brains in genomics, my call to you is to gather and use genetic data in the healthcare because I think we're almost ready. And if we don't think this way, and it doesn't matter whether you work on the mouse or the rat, it all contributes to that idea of precision medicine and doing things for patients. And I think that's probably most important. So thank you very much. I hope I was quick. But first, before you go, I need to acknowledge colleagues. Uh, there is Dell and Martin, you can recognize here and they've done a lot of work. And there are many other colleagues who over the years contributed to collecting patients and teaching us how to do things um, around the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Anna, for this beautiful presentation. Oh. They have some difficult <laughs> questions up there. So I didn't see any hands over there, did you? It's okay, I like difficult questions. So you challenge us to ask you a question. Yeah. And then you proceed to show us data where a renal injury gene, urobodulin, yeah. is a gene that you pull out in hypertension. Yeah. So my question for you is, is there really an association in the human population between hypertension and renal disease? And is it in that 80% of the unexplained heritability, those genes that we can't find. Mm -hmm. And what are those genes? Yeah, so the, the current <laughs> description why there was no association in the huge genome scan, GWAS, between the blood pressure and the renal phenotypes is that kidney is the special organ that is both the cause and the end organ damage, okay? So there are causal genes in the kidney and Lifton showed that beautifully and we can't dispute this, but also we know that with aging and hypertension, kidney is affected and damaged and you would agree with this because that's what you look at. So there is a combination of both cause, cause and effect and that's why normal associations don't do it. You're probably right, I am sure that below 10 multipl five multiplied by 10 to minus eight. There are lots of genes that are kidney genes that we haven't picked up and it must be the case also. So I think both are true. Yeah. Well, if we first go to the balcony with Waldorf and Stettler here. <laughs> no, Norbert, Norbert is sharpening his teeth. No. <laughs> Uh, I think, uh, as uh, we pointed out for, for Nilesh as well, it's, it's a fantastic effort to pull these huge cohorts together to uh, uh, actually interrogate this uh, uh, profoundly. But um, so I would like to ask, you have alluded to that each SNP uh, carries only a small risk in, in, uh, um, for, for uh, developing elevated blood pressure. Yeah. I mean, but you have the numbers actually to look at, since these are common variants, yep. uh, to look uh, at them in aggregates. Has that been actually done? And do you see that those um, individuals that aggregate many of the risk genes actually do have higher blood <coughs> pressures compared to those in the several 10,000s uh, that may not have these in accumulation? It's been done in this risk scores, but it's slightly different question. So you've seen that if you look at all your 29, right, and look at subjects who have 
88%, that's what I showed you in the cardiogram, 88% of blood pressure raising alleles, yeah? These people have very, very significantly increased risk of cardiovascular outcomes, so CAD, stroke, etc. So that's been shown. So we, we know that. And they do have higher blood pressure. So that's been done in this initial big papers, but you need to read into a additional material online. Uh, Anna, two things. Um, number one, do you really believe that genes ex explain everything in those conditions? I mean, surely even for the monogenic, or what we call monogenic, they should be called mainly monogenic. <coughs> because <coughs> even for those genes, those, those Lifton genes, surely yeah. there's an interplay between genes and environment and penetrance is sure. not 100%. And, you know, isn't there a spectrum? Is it not like most quantitative traits where there's a spectrum from monogenic to slightly less monogenic, etc.? Right. Well, it depends which condition. So if you look at glucocorticoid remediable aldosteronism, I happen to have four generational family. And although there is acceleration of severity as you go down in generations, yeah, so grandmother lived into 70 and had a little bit of hypertension, the mother was more affected, the children are much more affected and had a crisis with potassium in boots at age of five. So I think it depends on the condition. The autosomal dominant um, uh, things like GRA are really pretty dramatic and when you see these families it is almost 100% they have teenage severe hypertension with strokes renal failure all complications you can think of very early in life it's very very profound but there are other so profound but not quite a hundred percent sure but there are other presentations of course there is always gene environment interaction yeah. we can't get away from this yeah. there is always gene gene interaction as yeah. we heard we can't get away from this yeah. but there are certain things that are pretty robust okay so the question second one was not quite a matter of semantics or precision, but it's about the comment that you made about genetic risk scores adding up. Yeah. And sure, if you have more SNPs for the hypertension GWAS hits, it's going to add up, but you implied that it was going to add up to 25 millimeters of mercury. Now we know from the rat, from John Rapp, if you increased your, if you added together all of the individual blood pressure increases from individual loci. You'd have an animal that had a blood pressure of 300 millimeters sure, of mercury. I remember this picture, yeah. That's not possible. So are no. you saying that you believe that all of your SNPs, if they carry half or three quarters of a millimeter of mercury, that they're going to add together additively? Well, first, first of all, first of all <coughs> there will be some SNPs in the same individual that will go opposite direction. And if you see my graph, you see some that cross the line to another side. So obviously, like in John Rapp analysis, you will have both plus and minus. But nevertheless, remember, we haven't found everything. So there is more under... But if you take all the ones that are positive, yeah. you believe that you could just add up the No, you can't, because as we showed you already in the plot, there are some that are on the line and some that go the opposite direction. So even if you inherit everything um, bad, you still won't have 29 millimeters mercury. But you'll be pretty close to it, because the effects, if you, if you see the individual effects, you'll be pretty close to some 20 millimeter mercury. Uh, I have a question about these drug trials. You were mentioning that uh, you have NGS panel. This is whole genome, whole, this is whole exome, or you are, have specific genes. If you pick up specific genes, how do you pick up these specific right. genes? All, all of this. So the early, we're running five exemplars at the moment, and they mostly gene panels because it's easier to start that way large gene panels, and our exemplars are two in cancer, one rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, and inflammatory bowel disease, COPD, tissue samples. 
So in these exemplars, we mostly use gene panels, but the next stage will be NGS proper, not exomes, just in a you know, cover every possibility type of idea. So that's the plan. Okay, um, uh, <coughs> see you actually mentioned the environment factor, the, the environment factor, um, the disease risk. I know lots, the Chiwa study is a huge study. And I would like to um, ask you uh, whether, how you would, have you thought about epigenomic <coughs> factor and that we already see now, the epigeno, even DNA methylation, and there's twin study, they have same kind of genome, this, I mean, but the environment factor looks like sometime can, can even pass the generation. So sure. what's your expect your thought on? It looks like I didn't see that uh, you are you There question. was no analysis. There was no analysis of epigenomics in these studies so far, but the samples are there, the data are available, and there might be an opportunity to do some of this. It's obviously very interesting. We've seen in cancer genomics that uh, there are very big effects and it should be done, but it's not been looked at. Uh, I guess the, the big question for complex diseases is uh, basically to predict them rather than yeah. cure them when they're already established. So for the prediction value, um, mm, the best, uh, I think complex disease has the highest predictive value is rheumatoid arthritis. And why? It's not due to genomics, it's due to the actually autoantibodies that they found these yeah. citrullinate protein antibodies. It's really highly predictive value. And uh, I guess you can regard the blood pressure as kind of some sort of prediction. It's not a disease, but it leads to uh, it's cardiovascular a risk disease. Factor. But, but the predictive value of high blood pressure is, is much lower than, than these antibodies. So what's your strategy to find better predictors for cardiovascular disease? Is that the really large uh, population based where you can find genes that actually comes up before the disease but is not operating in the disease later on, uh, which I guess is new loci, maybe. Or is it due to something else? Understanding the mechanism, go, go more focused on, on, on what one could think is, is going for? What, how do you think the strategy for that would be? I think that's a fantastic philosophical question and there is no answer to it. I think clearly we can look at risk and this genetic risk scores could help us, but it isn't a risk of hypertension, it's a risk of complications and we should be treating before complications occur. So I don't think, you know, high blood pressure is not a disease, it's a risk factor for complications. We don't know at the moment who will get a stroke, who will get CAD, and patients don't, we, we can't say, would you rather have a stroke or a, or a myocardial infarction? It's not something I would like to say in the clinic. So what we need is, uh, markers of risk that will be available to get more aggressive treatment early on before we, because now we treat when the, um, you know, end organ damage already occurred, which is far too late, yeah? So my pheno phenotyping slide at the end was really meant to say, I don't want to see left ventricular hypertrophy strokes and CAD. I want to have a very aggressive preventive treatment before any of those will happen. So in your last part of your presentation, you make a warm plea for basically bringing all kinds of technologies and measurements yeah. together to, to come to a better diagnosis and treatment of a patient. <coughs> yes. So aren't we a little bit overpromising? Because let, let's say <laughs> we assume that the SHR rat was a patient. Yes. And we basically in the last decade have projected every possible technique very systematically on all kinds of organs of this uh, patient. Yeah. Do we now know what to do to treat this patient? How do we treat the well, hypertensive rat? Actually, I think that's an that's a interesting comparison. We know how to lower blood pressure. But, and you know, we can treat SHR beautifully. Uh, the issue is that 
with patients it's much more complicated because if we give um, whatever treatment to SHR in our animal house, it will be consumed. Patients are, are much more difficult. So we have patients who don't adhere to medication. We have patients who have so-called resistant hypertension. The resistant hypertension, well, 90 or 80 percent of them simply don't take tablets. So it's, it's really, <laughs> really, you know, there is, there is whole psychology of this. So I think we know how to lower blood pressure, but that doesn't solve the complexity of cardiovascular disease. Okay. Well, maybe but from what you're saying, also systematically measuring everything does also not solve it, right? So, no. But, uh, okay. Well, we keep the hope. So, Bina. Um, back to basic, basic, basic questions. Yeah. Um, I liked your comment on the SHR rat. Yeah. Is your first comparison that of the SHR rat, where the kidney isn't important at all? and therefore you don't see much of an association for chronic kidney disease. But in your second case where you have uromodulin, it's more like our S rats where they do have kidney disease and so they show up the kidney disease trait. Yeah. I guess what I'm asking is, do you have a clear picture there that it's really not chronic disease, that kidney disease at all that you're looking at, but something outside of it for sure? I think there is always element of kidney damage in long lasting hypertension. Remember, when we look at rats or mice, we seldom, there are some studies on aging, but not a lot. You do it quicker. In humans who now live longer and longer, there is always some element of kidney damage. So I guess the first question would then be, is the cohort very powerful for the hypertension phenotype and still hasn't reached the chronic kidney disease phenotype? Possibly, possibly. And also remember, if you gather 200,000 people around the world with different phenotyping, different blood pressure measurements, different everything. You do a very powerful study with very low p-values, but your phenotypic characterization of these patients cannot be perfect. Yeah? If you do smaller study, you're much more perfect in your phenotyping. Things are more you know, the same for everybody, etc. And maybe that's the difference. We don't know. Thank you. Additional questions? Thank you, you've exhausted yeah. them. Okay, thank you very much and thanks again, Nara. Thank you.